What's up guys? Welcome back to Tidal Gardens. Today I'd like to talk about some hammer corals. Now hammer corals are, I would say, one of the iconic large polyp stony corals in the reef aquarium hobby. They're extremely popular, uh, they've been around forever, and they appeal to both novice hobbyists as well as experienced hobbyists that are looking to add something into a mixed reef perhaps. I think what draws people to hammer corals, and this can be generalized to euphilia, so that's the hammers, torches, frog spawn, it's that their movement resembles something you would see with soft corals. They have very fleshy bodies, long extended tentacles, and they interact a lot with the current. In some cases, they can even host clownfish, things like that. I mean, clownfish these days are a little bit weird in the sense that um, a lot of them are captive bred, and they host in a lot of weird stuff that you wouldn't expect. I've seen them host in random bits of plastic, around pumps, in algae, weird, weird stuff. But it's, it's not as much of a stretch for them to host in something like a hammer coral. They are called hammer corals because the tips of their tentacles have a hammer-like appearance, but there's degrees of that appearance. So some of them look like a T shape. Others look almost like an anchor shape where the ends bend back towards the stalk a little bit. And there's others that are almost indistinguishable from torches that basically have just like a round dot at the tip. These are all hammers, different species of hammers, found in different geographies, but nonetheless, they are all hammers. The bigger distinction that I would call between all these different species of hammers and where all these hammers are found would be like the growth rate and the growth form that they would take. So for example, you can find hammers with a wall type skeleton and you can find them with a branching type skeleton. If I had a choice, I would pretty much always select hammers with a branching skeleton. They tend to be a lot more resilient. They tend to be faster growing. That's not to say that the wall hammers don't have their appeal as well. There are some fabulously colored ones. But for somebody that's interested in aquaculture like myself, I always tend towards uh, staying away from the wall varieties and sticking more with the branching types. In fact, like over the years, we've collected many, many types and either we've, we've sold some of the ones that were very interesting or perhaps something unfortunate happens and we lost it over the years, things happen. There was one in particular though that I really wish I still had. I have a, a photo of it and this is from many, many years ago. We sold it for a boatload of money. I don't ex remember exactly how much, it was a lot. It was a offer we couldn't resist sort of situation. And to this day, I really regret it. I see thousands of hammers a year, thousands and thousands. And I've never once seen anything like this one again. It was bright, bright yellow. It really stood out and it was branching. On top of all that, it was branching never seen it again so i re so again it just goes to show you like sometimes uh you know there are some special specimens out there that you really want to hold on to forever okay so let's talk a little bit about aggression hammer corals and euphilia in general they are apt to form sweeper tentacles that can combat nearby corals so you're going to want to give these guys plenty of space their sweepers aren't super damaging. Their stings are, I would say, kind of middle of the road in terms of intensity. So if they're trying to like sting a nearby leather coral, for example, I'm not sure if I would necessarily care. If they're trying to sting nearby SPS, I would care a little bit more. Those tend to be a little bit more sensitive to this sort of thing. Now, how far should you give them? Given that these guys can extend quite a bit, given that they, especially with the branching varieties, tend to grow somewhat quickly, I would say give them like six to 10 inches just to be safe. The other question I always receive is, can you keep hammers close to different hammers, close to one another? Can you keep them close together and touching frog spawn or torches and, and things of that sort? Simple answer is yes. The more complicated answer is it's not quite so ideal. 
they are absolutely trying to sting each other. I can show you some clips here and there of, um, of some you know, sweeper behavior. Now, again, they kind of resist stinging from each other pretty well. So it's not the end of the world if you have like a, like a frog spawn and a hammer touching, but it's not ideal. And if, things, if something else changes in the tank that would make stuff go downhill, this extra bit of stress isn't helping the situation. Okay, real quick on feeding. You would think that with something with these long waving tentacles that they would be very, very, very easy to feed. In my experience, hammers don't really eat that readily. Their tentacles can grab food. Yeah, very clearly, they, they can grab both uh, pellet food, such as sustainable aquatics, that, that tends to be a halfway decent uh, coral food. Fauna Marin makes a pretty good LPS pellet. And uh, just like frozen food, like mice, small bits of krill, all that stuff can be fed. Uh, they don't really go out of their way to aggressively grab onto food and take it in. So is it worth feeding? Because what's, what's more likely to happen is that the flow itself is just going to blow the food away or fish are going to come and pick it off. Either way, any little bit of commotion around the coral, it's going to prevent that coral from eating. And even in like the most controlled circumstances where the coral, like the hammer coral, is taking in that food, oftentimes what happens is in a couple minutes it spits it right back out. I am such a big proponent of feeding corals. In this particular situation, I'm not loving the idea of spot feeding hammer corals. I just don't think that it's worth the potential to, I guess, overfeed the tank in general and the benefits of having this coral fed um, are kind of outweighed by the chance that you might just overfeed your tank and cause nutrient imbalances. As far as lighting goes, hammer corals I look to have a kind of middle of the road lighting exposure, something in the neighborhood of 100 par. They really don't need intense lighting and on top of that they are very consistent in their coloration so you might be able to get slightly better coloration by providing um, brighter lights. But again, there's the risk of overexposing the coral. And the risk of overexposure is far worse than any aesthetic benefit that you might have by dialing up the lights a little bit more. So if it were me, I would tend to stay towards the middle to low end of the lighting intensity spectrum. Anything from 50 to 100 par is probably every bit of what a hammer coral needs. As far as water flow goes, they can handle quite a bit of flow, but you can tell when you're giving too much flow when um, basically all the tentacles are shooting off to one side and the flesh at its base is getting exposed. I would prefer kind of like a medium to even lower currents because one of the things that I noticed is that in, in higher currents, a lot of euphilia tend to contract quite substantially. We had purchased some larger colonies from a local hobbyist in town here. And he has a, a six foot tank, so it's not, uh, it's not a, a particularly small tank. And these euphilia took up maybe like a quarter of his tank. In my tank though, which has much less flow, all of these euphilia that we took from, from this hobbyist had really extended. So you go from a situation where he's, he has a tank that's high flow for SPS and whatnot, and these, these colonies stayed somewhat small and manageable. But in my tank where they're really able to extend, you would not be able to then take these large colonies and put them back into his tank. They simply wouldn't fit. Same corals, different flow, had very different extension. My personal preference on what type of flow would be best there really isn't a, a best, but I, I like it when the corals extend a little bit more, but still have some good motion to them. So uh, I'd, I'd say in, in that medium flow range, not so much into the higher higher flow. And low flow, you're not quite getting the, the same movement, but you're getting the crazy extension. So let's talk a bit about you know potential problems that you might have. As far as pests go, there's only one that I've ever noticed, and it's pretty easy to deal with. It's these uh, flatworms that tend to settle on large polyp stony corals. That can be dealt with pretty easily just by some periodic dipping. They're not that common. 
So it's not like, oh, like every, every Euphilia, every hammer has these things. They really don't. They usually are gonna be more of a problem on like the commercial end, more so than the hobbyist end, because again, they're not that common and they're really easy to, to dip and, and eliminate. Sometimes a more common problem people will have is like a bacterial infection called brown jelly. And it, it pretty much looks like what it sounds like, kind of this brown fungusy looking gelatinous growth. And it's highly lethal. It's basically Ebola. You know how people say Ebola is like, like a bad parasite because it kills the host too quickly. So it doesn't ever really spread as far as it could. Brown jelly is kind of the same way. It spreads quickly and it kills quickly. And so oftentimes when I see something with brown jelly, it's on its way out almost by the time that I would even notice it. Now, if you do want to be proactive and try to uh, try to remedy that situation, iodine dipping aggressively for the course of like a couple days, maybe three, four days in a row, can save the coral. But again, it's kind of unlikely at that point. So those are like the two different things that I would look for as far as like care. You're looking at flatworms, you're looking at brown jelly. Now, if you just see it randomly start contracting, for days in a row, what I tend to do is ramp up uh, like some activated carbon, or maybe like change out the carbon. Something in the water might be bothering it, and also to do like a medium-sized water change. And sometimes like just having a fresh water change will kind of resuscitate some of these hammer corals that aren't feeling so well. All right, so that does it for my thoughts and care tips on hammer corals. Hope you guys got something from this, and I hope to see you all next time. Happy reefing, guys. Take care.